Hello, everybody. I am Chris Acharya, a.k.a. Acharky from GamingForever.com. And with me is a very special guest. He is the CEO and founder of Minicore Studios, who are currently working on Like a Believes, The Sun at Night, an episodic 2D adventure game featuring Russia's first astronaut in space, a dog, because why else would you care? Uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, please welcome John Warren. Welcome, sir. Hey, how are you? I am doing fantastic. And how are you? I'm good. It's uh, it's already really hot here in Austin, but that's pretty par for the course. Yeah, it's uh, uh, the yeah. The, we- the weather in Ohio has been similar, although you know it's only gotten up to about eighty degrees. But usually it gets really hot here because the humidity is so thick you can cut it with a knife. I, I have an Ohio question for you before we get started. If sure, that's all right. Sure. Uh, how do you pronounce L I M A? L I M A. Yeah, like the city of Ohio. Uh, oh, uh, Lima. Okay, all right, all right. Yep, Lima. I, I, I'm, go- I'm going to a wedding in Lima at the end of September, and someone tried to tell me it was Lima, and I'm like, no, that's that's Peru, uh, <laughs> and I believe Ohio, it's pronounced Lima. Yep, anyway, Lima, like the Lima bean, as yeah, the locals okay. I talk to know it. Okay, I, I didn't mean to derail us with uh, Ohio talk, but I just had to know. No, that's that's perfectly fine. And <laughs> Okay. And hopefully, you know, and I'm, there will be plenty of time to talk about you and this <laughs> wonderful game that you guys have sure. currently developed. So Absolutely. before we, so before we get to that, uh, for our listeners, give us a little bit of background about yourself and some of the stuff that you've done. Yeah, so um, I, you know, I'm, I'm relatively new to games. You know, I was uh, um, a graduate student in 2011, which is actually when I started the company, and. Um, it really just started as almost a, uh, a thing that, you know, a, a thing that I needed to see if I could do, you know, to start a company and, uh, go through those steps. And I was in business school, so that's kind of why mm. I was doing it. And, um, you know, I've been kind of bouncing around to different studios, uh, in Austin, um, some mobile, some, you know, uh, one was making an MMO, um, And, and I just didn't, um, not only did it kind of bum me out that I was going to have to work my way up a ladder for five to 10 years, uh, frankly, but, uh, you know, none of them were really doing the kind of stuff that I wanted to do. So, um, after I started the company, uh, I kind of talked to a few friends, um, and strangers about just kind of joining and seeing what we could do. And the first thing that we, uh, came up with was actually like a believe. So that, that, that game is actually, uh, more than two and a half years old. Uh, we've been developing it kind of on and off since then. Um, but since we started the company, we released two games. Uh, one is an Android game called Tanks for the Memories, uh, where you, uh, you play as a psychologist and you go into people's minds, uh, with tanks to blow up their problems. Because how um, else would you solve problems? How well, I mean, that's how I solve my problems. So <laughs> uh, it's autobiographical, actually. So, uh, but uh, I would not recommend playing that game, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it's because it is broken. We basically abandoned it a few months after we released it, uh, just to be just to be honest, because uh, the fragmentation of Android is so bad, and you know. Uh, we figured out that the game really worked well on about three specific uh, makes and models of Samsung phones, mm-hmm. and that was about it. So, yeah, uh, and that's, I mean, and that's been a common complaint among a lot of developers is yeah, yeah. just how how split you know the Android development base is and right. why it can be difficult to go there. And and so now you know two years after the fact, I mean we have so much more experience than we did. You know I I, I think we could go back to Android and be totally fine, but you know that game is just kind of sitting there, um, you know uh, rotting away. <laughs> but uh, uh, the second game we made is a, a word game for iOS uh, called Tumble Words, and uh, you know I know I know most people probably go okay, well we need another word game for iOS like a sharp stick in the eye, but. Um, but it's it's really unique. It's kind of different from anything we played, and uh, the real emphasis for us is usually on art. And so if you go check it out, 
Uh, it's a universal app for iPhone, iPad, all that stuff. Uh, beautiful, beautiful art. Uh, we've commissioned a few artists like uh, Casey Green, who does a uh, gun show comic, and uh, Chris Onstad, who does Akewood. He, um, you know, they both contributed art to the game, and uh, it's really awesome. So uh, we're really proud of that. It's still, you know, going pretty strong, multiplayer, single player, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I, you know, Like a Believes is really the thing that we started to make. Um, back in 2011, and we took a couple pretty big breaks to make these mobile games, and we had various reasons to do that. Most of them were investor-related, kind of getting right. games out there so we could actually, you know, raise the money to make Like a Believes. Um, it's really hard to raise money if you don't have something on the market. Uh, so yeah, we had to do that. And uh, but Like a Believes has been our passion really since day one, and uh, we're wrapping it up. I mean, we still have some, some pretty significant work to do, but, um, you know, it'll, it'll be done here pretty soon. So. That sounds terrific. So, so getting into Like a Believes, yeah. what kind of, what kind of came first when you got, like, when you guys got the inspiration for this idea? Was it just you wanted to make a game based off of this, you know, historic dog? Or was it that, you kind of came with the gameplay first, like, you know, we want to make a 2D action game, and then kind of, or, you know, I mean, what, what was kind of the process when you guys got the inspiration to start making Like a Believes? Uh, so, uh, Peter Odom is our creative director, and uh, and Peter and I, we, um, you know, we've been, I won't say fans of the story, because it's obviously a, a uh, uh, very sad story, but yeah. but very we've been we've been you know, scholars, I guess, of the story, just kind of studying it, kind of studying every aspect of it, um, both the good and bad, and interesting and mundane, and um, uh, not only that, but we also read uh, Nick Abad Ab- uh, Abadzis. <laughs> I actually have no idea how you say his last name, uh, but he he made a. Uh, uh, graphic novel um, that's kind of a, a fictionalized telling of like a story and um, you know I'm not saying that we're basing our story off of that but right. just just you know artifacts from uh, you know uh, other writers and comics and things like that uh, really kind of got us interested in making a game for it because we hadn't seen a game based on it before now since we started developing actually a couple of things have happened. One is that um, I believe it's uh, Manhattan, the, the comic series. Uh, they have actually introduced Laika as a character with shoulder-mounted uh, machine gun, oh, which man. is kind of amazing. So uh, I'm not saying there are any shenanigans there. I just think it's kind of interesting that these ideas are in the ether and people just kind of gravitate toward them. And, and we uh, see and, more and Laika stuff you just, as we... what. Hearing you describe that just makes me want to see it. Just <laughs> right, right, yeah. So, and the other, you know, there have been some other games too, like uh, Escape from Puppy Death Factory was one that was, uh, I think, very, very loosely based on Leica. It was kind oh. of like a puzzle. It was kind of like a puzzle platformer. Um, but you know, we've seen Leica's influence in games really since we started. Uh, but you know, there still hasn't been a substantial game that's based on, you know, the actual story. Um, not that we don't take extremely dramatic license with with everything, <laughs> but um, yeah, the story really came first, and that's um, for better or worse. That's really a lot of times where we start is kind of with either a character or a setting or a story, and we usually find the best way to tell that story. And in this case, we thought it was a uh, kind of a two D action platformer, although it didn't start like that. Um, it, it actually started as this weird hybrid of a 2D action game and a rail shooter, um, where you know you'd have these intervals where you'd be exploring and all that stuff, but then you'd have these sequences of these kind of rail shooter shoot 'em up kind of thing, and uh, we just couldn't get that to work the way we wanted to, and so uh, we basically took some of the shoot 'em up elements and just put that into the actual 2D aspect, so um, yeah, 2D platformer aspect. So that's uh, that's kind of where we ended up. All right, um, you know, and looking at you know, and right off the bat, I love the look of this game. It 
Thanks. has a, you know it has a really kind of there there's something about it that kind of makes it look unique and it does kind of stand out uh sure. with uh the overall style and you know i mean the fact that you know this is this is like a in a spacesuit although <laughs> which, sure. which looks fantastic so uh tell us like you know for those who may be unaware yeah. what is this game <laughs> if, okay. If you haven't said that already. But. Yeah, absolutely. So, Like It Believes uh, it starts with uh, the discovery of Laika by a group of rebels uh, in the uh, uh, in, in the Kazakh uh, desert, basically. So, uh, there are these group of rebels uh, and they go and discover Laika and um, there's a capsule, and uh, yeah, the rebels discover that Laika can talk, and so uh, they bring her to the camp, and you know they show her this kindness of taking care of her, and she doesn't really understand what's happening, but she can talk and she can understand, um, and you know that's really where it takes off because uh, you figure out in Laika's absence. Um, the Soviets have essentially discovered some source of technology, which you'll obviously explore, and uh, they've become imperialists. So, you know, these are not the Soviets that existed, you know, in the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, that kind of thing. It, it, it is a new wave of imperialist Soviets, uh, and you'll recognize some names, um, you know, some names are obviously mentioned in historical names and locations and things like that. But you know, this is a very, very different Soviet Union. So they've basically become imperialists and taken over uh, uh, a large amount of the world. And uh, to be honest, the U.S. and Great Britain basically don't exist uh, because Man. they've been bombed out. So um, you've got these splinter cells of people who want to overthrow these imperial Soviets. And these rebels discover, okay, Laika uh, not only has a spacesuit suit, but she can uh, attach mount, uh, weapons to her uh, suit. Uh, she has a shield that basically shields her from a lot of attacks. And so they go, okay, well, let's, uh, let's use Laika to uh, overthrow the Soviets. So that's kind of where the story takes off, and you go from there and explore a lot of stuff. And uh, there are some twists and turns, but not, you know, nothing too completely insane. Uh, and the gameplay is really kind of, um, a hybrid of games like Cave Story or EG, um, but also games like, uh, Deus Ex. So, uh, it's not really like Metroid in the sense that you're gated. So, like, um, you're not going to pick up the missile to blow up, uh, the pink door. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not... It's not a game where you're picking up items to specifically get to certain areas. It's kind of deciding what kind of build out you want for your character and how to best use it to get through these uh these big big levels um so that's that's it i mean you know we uh kind of another big element is the um we have kind of a three headed three headed monster in terms of uh, the skills that you can develop, and you've got your offensive skills, which basically is like your weapons and grenade mods and things like that, just things that will help you overpower your enemies. And then we have uh, a defensive skill tree, which you have got the shield, and you can increase elements of the shield and uh, produce counterattacks and things like that in case the shooting thing just isn't for you. Uh, but then also exploration, so uh, abilities to hack certain things and uh, double jump and wall jump and rocket jump and a lot of other exports, exploration and utility kind of items that will allow you to explore the world more thoroughly. So it's really just kind of up to your play style. That was really important to us, and uh, that's kind of the, the cornerstone of the game itself. Yeah, I mean, you know, you talk about exploration, and, you know, hearing you describe the game, this is... This, this totally sounds like something right up my alley, especially, oh, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, being, you know, I was, you know, I was born in 1982, and, you know, I grew yeah. up on a lot of, uh, you know, kind of Metroid, Castlevania-style yeah. games, and, you know, Definitely. and, it, it, you know, and it's great to see, you know, 2D action games being still still being made today, yeah. and, you know, even with, uh, you know, 
kind of like recent stuff like with Guacamelee, um, mm-hmm. to where yeah, it's like there there is this thing of exploration, but you know that's always been kind of a common theme of you know kind of gating off the player until you get this thing. Right. Or yeah. Kind of yeah. limiting where you can and can't go, and it is kind of nice. I mean, because it kind of, you know it it kind of increases uh, uh, your audience a bit because you know there's going to be people that you know well maybe I don't want to find everything I just want to get through and see yeah. you know this fantastic story that you come up with or yeah. or you know and if you're like me who is just this completionist of I want to find everything, everything. and yeah. I will not rest until I explore every single nook and cranny of this map which yeah. You know, it's just, again, just my completionist nature and why I love a lot of this stuff. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah. So that sounds fantastic. And the fact that, you know, Leica just sounds like this, this you know, <laughs> Iron Man of dogs almost with just this, this power suit and all these different abilities and things that she can get and use so yeah she's she's pretty special i mean we're, we're really making her to be kind of a, an awesome character and uh obviously her abilities just kind of augment a lot of that stuff so I, I think uh i think that's you know that's such a huge deal to us is just making her seem not only powerful but also vulnerable and interesting and uh um yeah that's going to be a big part of the game so so uh the sun at night is yes. pitched as the first episode in a three part series. Yeah. So uh so my question that I'm kind of curious about is what led to the decision of making this something episodic? episodic? Yeah. So that uh that's really simple. Um that was basically a money decision. Uh and I've seen a lot of people beat around the bush when they're asked questions like that. And I guess, like, I don't see the, the point. Uh, basically, uh, we had this, you know, one, one singular story to tell. And um, we knew that, you know, it was going to take these kind of story beats and these gameplay beats to get it done the way we wanted it to. Uh, but then a, a while back, um, before a lot of information really surfaced about the game, uh, we just looked at our abilities, uh, our kind of nature as developers, and we went, okay, like if, if we if we do everything that we want to do in one fell swoop, um, this is this is going to be almost impossible for us. And so we, oh, excuse me, uh, we knew that splitting it into three parts was actually really easy because. Uh, the story is kind of uh, set up in a way to do that kind of naturally. Um, and we also knew that shorter games are becoming more in vogue. Now, that's not to say that this game doesn't have a lot of meat on it, um, and it's not filler. It's actually really cool content. But, uh, you know, instead of making one single, uh, uh, like, 35-hour game, we decided, okay, let's make three 10-hour games. And let's see how the first one goes. Uh, if it does well, then obviously we're going to make the second two, and it's going to be great. Uh, but even if it doesn't do that great, we can take the information that we got from the first one and figure out, okay, what could we change uh, or alter or tweak to make the next installments that much better? So it made sense to us from a lot of standpoints. One, we actually really admired how Mass Effect dealt with episodes one, two, and three. I know, I know the end of three, uh, was extremely controversial for a lot of people, which I, which I, which I understand. But, but when you look at just the scope of that, I mean, it's, it's extraordinarily impressive. I mean, it really is. And, and I think, you know, we, you know, Bioware was obviously, well, Bioware as it used to exist, not really maybe today, uh, (laughs) But Bioware, as it used to exist, um, was a huge influence on us. And so, uh, you know, we, we felt confident doing it. I know some people have a lot of fatigue when it comes to kind of episodic or trilogy content. Believe me, we weren't, we weren't a developer that was out to make massive trilogies from the get go, but right. it just made, it just made sense to us as a small developer that has, uh, you know, limited experience, uh, to do it this way. So. 
Yeah, I mean, and there's also, I mean, there's kind of the stigma that people have when they hear the term episodic being used. A lot of sure. people think, like, oh, this is probably something I can finish in an afternoon, and, you know, it's not going to yeah, be that long. Yeah, that is definitely not the case. I mean, that, that is, and, and, I, and I totally admit that that's, that's the hardest thing to overcome is because, you know, with, with even The Walking Dead and stuff like that, it's like you could beat those episodes pretty quick. And I think, you know, I'm not one of those people that beats on the drum of you got to have a certain money to value to yeah. gameplay thing. Thing I'm really not. I'm a person. I'm a person that would have paid sixty bucks for Gone Home, which just came out. I would have. Yeah, I got um, it. Gone Home is really interesting, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I I love it. And and you know, people are like, oh, it's twenty bucks. It's too expensive. But it's like, you know, I get intrinsic value from games, and so. It's it's not you know it's not this thing that that really resonates with me, but I understand it you know it's like it's so we we definitely have set out to make games that you're not going to be able to beat in an afternoon. You're going to have to take probably a couple of days to do it. Now if you if you just blow through it, if you skip a ton of conversation, if you just go from point A to point B, you could probably do that. But I think the vast majority of players are not going to do that, and they're going to take a couple of days at least to get this done. So. Right, and I mean, you know, and earlier you had said that you know one episode could probably be about ten hours, yeah, you know, yeah. which which already to me blows any kind of misconceptions out of the water for like, oh, this is this almost sure. feels like an entire full game, and, and yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's a little tough because we we started using the word episodic, and I think we kind of got you know it, we 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 used two words really early on, we used episodic and Metroidvania. And the more we developed the games, with the game, we went, oh crap, like pr- probably both of those aren't totally right. You know, it's, you know, it's not totally Metroidvania because it doesn't gate you and it has more to do with story and all this stuff. And then Episodic's not really right because, you know, these are big beefy, uh, you know, uh, sections of this, of, of this overarching story. So it, it's a, you know, we still say episodic because that's ultimately what it comes down to and you'll be able to transfer save files and stuff like that. So it's not, you know, it's not incorrect, but it does carry a certain amount of stigma with it. Yeah. But already, I mean, this sounds like, uh, you know, this sounds incredible, uh, okay. you know, having, yeah. you know, each one of these, e- each one of these, uh, you know, each one of these games uh, that's going to have like a pretty big portion of the narrative and being able yeah. to kind of focus on that, which I think, you know, is, you know, it can still be a really great way to tell a story. And, yeah. you know, an episodic, you know, it is certainly not a bad thing. I mean, you know, Telltale has really pioneered, you know, yeah, that whole idea. They've um, made that work really well, yeah. And I think, and I think what's really great, I mean, you know, there are a lot of people that, you know, look at it and say, well, I'll just wait till all three of them come out. But sure. really, you, I think what's really great about playing each one as their release is, especially when you have like a really engaging story, is mm-hmm. you kind of tend to talk about that. And that was one of the things that, you know, uh, not really completely derailing, but, you know, when you look at The Walking Dead, it was kind mm-hmm. of genius how, how they put out episode by episode because, you know, people got talking. And people got, you know, really excited, like, what is going to happen to this character next? What is going to yeah. be the next big thing? And, you know, and hearing, you know, about Like of Belize, I think, I like, I hope that's kind of what happens with this, is that people get so invested in this story and are just kind of hanging on, like, you know, oh, man, this, what is going to happen to Like and next? And these people, yeah. and what's going to be the outcome of this? And I, it, it, it's, it, it, it kind of really is a great way of kind of building that excitement and that, that kind of tension and in an interesting yeah. way. I, I'm a big TV guy. And so I, I you know, I, I love TV. Uh, and I, I, I both been watch and, uh, week by week watch a lot of different shows. And so I, there's merits of both. You know, I basically binged breaking bad because I didn't watch it when it was first on. And I episode watched, uh, well, let me let me think of a good one that I saw from start to finish. Uh, House is a good. I, I watched every single episode of that from start to finish for eight years. Never binge watched it, and I also, you know, uh, you know, Breaking Bad, Lost. I binge watched those, and I think I think there are definitely merits to both. I think someone who picks up all three at once um, definitely won't be disappointed. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I think that is the ideal for me is that, you know, I, I am really interested in this kind of dialogue, uh, this running dialogue with not only our players, but, you know, between the players. Um, and, you know, not only, you know, choice, choice is also, uh, a big deal in our game. And it's not, it's not those big choices like, you know, we're not advertising these mass effect choices and then under delivering. Um, right. but it's, it's more of these subtle choices, right? So it's like, uh, who you help and who helps you and things like that. And, uh, you forge different relationships with folks depending on your, um, your decisions. And so, you know, some of those little tweaks will actually make your playthrough really different from mine or, um, you know, or, or, you know, and, and, you know, between other people too. So no singular playthrough on the gameplay or story side will be exactly the same. Um, and, that's uh, that's really exciting. I mean, that's one of those things that we didn't like set out to do, but then we kind of had this realization that the systems we were building, it's like, oh, well, yeah, this is a super unique, replayable experience that you'll get over and over again. And so, yeah, I think I think having that dialogue running between the episodes is obviously something that I would love. I think the big question mark is, you know, the the, the episodes, you know, it's not going to be four weeks when the next episode comes out. It's probably right. going to be, you know, four months is more like it. So, you know, how does that dialogue keep going? And, you know, maybe it's other content that we produce, uh, like on on the web or something, you know, who knows? But, um, uh, you know, it's definitely a dialogue that I want to run, you know, through the duration of the of the series. So, uh, yeah. yeah, and I mean, and I, and I kind of love that style of choice to where it's not these black and white areas. Am I going to be good? Am I going to be bad? But really, more so yeah. of of who whose trust do I want to earn? Yeah, Which, that's a big. That's that's you hit it. You hit it on the nose. I mean, that's actually a big part of the game. Is you know who who are you going to be able to trust and, and things like that. So uh, yeah, that's a huge deal. Yeah. So. Um, uh, not long ago, you guys were able to receive, you know, a good amount of funding, you know, for the initial game, which, yes. you know, is great. Yeah. Uh, and kind of pushing more towards, you know, your stretch goals of, you know, making sure that everything is, is, uh, sound design and everything is working right. Um, yeah. but there is also, you know, talk of wanting to localize this for, you know, other forward territories. Yeah. Since uh I guess there has been some interest in this game from Oh gosh. You know, from, for, from forward countries. Like can you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah. So that that's been really awesome it actually is uh you know, I I knew that this would have, you know, a lot of story based games do have international appeal. Um but I I I guess I underestimated how uh big that would be. So a lot of Latin American um, websites and folks on Kickstarter uh, have backed us, and uh, we've done interviews with some Spanish-language websites, and uh, that's been huge. Russia has been a mixed bag, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, you know, what, you know there, there are a lot of backers that we have who are Russian who are really excited about the game. And we kind of take our cues from them, uh, the people who get that it's a game and that it's fiction and that it's, um, you know, it's it's not a perpetuation of stereotypes that actually still exist mm -hmm. instead of just things that are, you know, kind of common uh, archetypal items from the actual Soviet era. But, uh, you know, so a lot of people have a good uh, sense of humor about it and they understand that it's not something that we're trying to... Uh, lampoon, um, but then there have been a lot of Russian folks who are, are mad, and um, and that that it seems to be coming from a lot of kind of um, uh, nationalists and people who are kind of uh, no joke like neo Stalinists. Oh God! So people who you know that's the that's a thing you know that is a real thing, and um. I underestimated how big that would be. So if you if you ever go to our Steam Greenlight page, you can see uh, because uh, is I think Steam's third uh, highest volume of of uh, players, and uh, a lot of them are not happy that we did this. In fact, I had to moderate some comments because there was some pretty gross anti-Semitic, anti-gay stuff there for a while. Um, 
which was problematic. But uh, to, I'm digressing a little. But uh, for the most part, Russia is pretty excited, uh, from what I can tell. And uh, there are a lot of websites that picked us up and, and spoken of the story kind of warmly. And um, so not only that, but a lot of American countries, uh, we've had some interest from Italian and French uh, players uh, as well as German players. And it's just really obvious to me that with with a game that has such a rich story, um, you know, I don't want language to be a barrier for that. So that's really the main reason we're still, excuse me, we're still running our Kickstarter. <laughs> And so we can afford to do that. Um, and, you know, we're, we're under the gun, but hopefully we'll make it. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. you know, I still got my fingers crossed because, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I totally want to see this become a reality. It's like I'm just super excited to be able to play all three parts and witness yeah. all this crazy stuff. Not to mention, you know, I mean, every time I look at the footage for the gameplay, it, you know, again, being like 30-some years old and playing games for a good portion of my life, it really tickles the nostalgia center of my brain of, yeah. you know, 2D action and sci-fi and, and of course, dogs, which yes. who doesn't love dogs? Yeah, um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of animals in the game. A lot of animals in the game. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, it's not dust in Elysian tale, but it's like, it, <laughs> it's, it's definitely an animal heavy game. Um, and so, yeah, not only like it, but you'll see a lot of other stuff too. So it's, uh, I don't know. We, we're big animal people, so. That's, oh, that was kind you, of a no-brainer. Yeah, and you were you were definitely talking to the right website. <laughs> we're we're, we're preaching to the choir, I guess. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, the uh, the other big thing about like some of the stretch goals were you know because right now I mean you guys are more focused on bringing this to PC Linux and Mac. Yeah, PC Mac Linux. Yeah. And you know I mean you know with the you know possibility of you know, hopefully if this gets picked up or if people, if enough interest is shown of possibly bringing this to consoles. Yeah, so uh, probably the most I can say about that, I mean, we've got some stretch goals on Kickstarter attached to that. Uh, unless there is, uh, I, uh, you know, unless, uh, uh, I don't know, Donald Trump, not that I'd want him to donate, but unless he comes in and just, drops a, a fat stack of cash, we're probably not going to hit those, but uh, we, you know, we've got some special attached, attached to that. We know we want to be on uh, PlayStation because we, just, we love the Vita, we love what Sony's been doing, um, and I also love the Wii U, and um, the Wii U's uh, gamepad would actually make that version probably the definitive version because you could do some stuff with the touch the with the touchpad that um, you know you can't do with other consoles. Um, with Vita Remote Play, we might be able to do something like that. You know, if they flesh that out a lot, but we'll we'll see. Um, I, I'll tell you that we're talking. Uh, we're we've got yeah you know, we're we're we've got some interest I guess from. Uh, some folks to bring it to console. I can't really talk more than that, but right. um, I think uh, not only you know are we looking at the consoles that are listed on the Kickstarter, but next gen stuff too. So um, a lot of those systems are kind of opening up, and those processes are opening up, and that's a really big deal for indies. And um, hopefully, we'll have some kind of announcement soon. Uh, I'd like that announcement before the Kickstarter ends, obviously, to build some interest. But, right. uh, but yeah, I think, you know, I think people ought to feel pretty good that it's going to come to console. Um, but I can't right now say which ones or when. Um, but, you know, I do think, you know, looking at it objectively, uh, I think we would thrive on console. Um, and maybe even more so than back in PC. Uh, but, um, but yeah, right now the focus is just getting the base game done and, and getting that out there for, for PC and Mac and Linux. Right. And and this is probably, you know, most likely going to be on Steam, hopefully. Well, yeah, we need to do a lot better on Greenlight than we're oh, doing. Man. So, you know, get 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 the word out. Um I can't uh you know, I don't want to say, hey, yeah, I love Greenlight, because uh, I don't. Um I but they you know they approved a hundred games yesterday uh, right which was which was huge yeah uh, but also a weird kind of 
red flag to me that that whenever someone does something like that, I'm like, okay, something's about to happen. Like they're either about to shut this down completely or they're testing some horrible new thing. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm always kind of a pessimist, but like, uh, I, that that was actually not I, I don't know that was like ominous news to me that they uh, greenlit so many but maybe it's a good maybe it's a really good thing maybe they'll start doing these massive chunks and so we won't have to have uh, thirty five thousand yes votes or whatever it is to get to get on um, but yeah we need a lot of help uh, on that side of things so hopefully we'll we'll get there sometime right but you know even if you know if it doesn't happen you know I'm pretty sure. You know, we can find this game. You know, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll probably be on GOG. Um, uh, we like GOG a lot. Um, I and, I like GOG a lot too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, GOG. I mean, GOG is great. Their their system is way more open and transparent than the green light system is. And so, um, you know, once we finish up the game, I, I think we you know, we won't have any trouble getting it on GOG. And that's really, I don't know that. That's that's enough for me for now while we wait on the seam stuff. And so as long as we have that, I feel pretty good. So you'll definitely be able to find the game. Right. Um, I think uh, with that, uh, we'll probably bring this to a close. Uh, sure. Anything else you anything else you'd like to say about the game? Uh, maybe anything you want to plug? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I'll, I'll do I'll do the podcast plug kind of thing. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at John E. Warren. Um, I like Twitter. I like talking to people on Twitter, and that's really good. Uh, you can follow Minicore Studios at Minicore Studios. Um, if you go to our website, you can find more information of on you know, all of our games. Uh, it's minicorestudios.com. Uh, we have a Twitch channel, Minicore Studios. Uh, our Kickstarter is still going. We have about 72 hours left, so wow, 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 help us out with that. Um, and yeah, I mean, the game, you know, will be out later this year. Uh, we're super excited about it. Uh, I know a lot of other people are too, which is like the coolest thing in the world. So, um, we're just super excited about bringing, bringing like a story, um, to as many people as we possibly can. So, that's uh I don't know that's probably all the plug-in I need to do. All right, I I hopefully speak for a lot of people when I say I am super pumped to see this game become a reality and well, play it for myself. Uh, yeah. It looks fantastic, and you heard the man, folks. You know where to go if you want to find information about Like It Believes: The Sun at Night, which hopefully will be releasing on PC, Mac, and Linux soon. And my guest has been Johnny Warren from uh, Minicore Studios. John, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks. Have a good one. Thanks. You too.